I'm hitting record here. Oh, yeah, welcome back from lunch. Now that you're all sleepy, mm -hmm. I can uh, start talking about what, basically what I did over the last two years to curl, I think it's the best way to put it. Um, about myself, my name is Stefan Eising. Eising at Curl Social on Mastodon. I'm a manager of the Apache HTTP D team since 2015. Uh, I brought in the HTTP2 implementation there and the Let's Encrypt support for Apache Web Server. Uh, I was working for a company I founded in 2000 named Greenbytes. Uh, you will see from my colleague Julian Reschke uh, Greenbytes a lot of the HTTP RFCs by the ITF, where he is a uh, uh, contributor there. And my first since we are open source, my first contact with, it was not really called open source, was in 1989 when we did some, with a friend of mine, shareware for the Atari 68K machines. And uh, that was a software for users like a Finder on Macintosh or an Explorer on Windows <coughs> with a shell inside. And we shipped that with floppy disks, with people sent us envelopes with return envelopes and floppy disk and we copied the floppy disk and sent it back. That was a little bit of a nuisance which the internet solved then many years later. So it was a dark and stormy night <coughs> in autumn 2022 when Daniel knocked at my door and asked about, hey, how, how would you feel about working, making HTTP proxy <coughs> in a thing? How, how hard can it be? It's just code. It's <laughs> <laughs> So I went into curl and I looked like, well, how could we do this feature, like using an HTTP2 proxy with curl? And that was then curl 7.86. Um, so I started to go really into the internals. I used curl already for years, but I've never looked really inside the source code that uh, much. So how, how does the connection setup work in curl? And what you have in curl 786 was a couple of abstractions. You have the protocol handlers, so you had specific implementations for the schemes of the URLs. You had each each transfer you do. Everything is called a transfer in curl. It has <coughs> specific <coughs> states. It is connecting. It is doing something. It is performing. It is done like a state machine on the general. And for sending and receiving for a transfer, the connections have callbacks. Send and receive. So what <coughs> a sample thing here, a little bit simplified in the curl uh, at the time was like you connect the socket, you prepare the request, you do data consent, this is the send callback where you send the request bytes, and then you call the sockets until the server comes with a response and you call data con receive to receive the data from the socket and then process the response for the transfer. And you see like the callbacks involved here in the transfer handling. And for HTTPS, um, there was then a way like you connect the socket and then you replace these callbacks, the send receive callbacks, with the SSL specific ones. You do then the encrypted and decryption uh, for the send and receive data. And otherwise it's like you do the usual HTTP protocol handler on top. Um, if you do HTTP requests via an HTTP proxy tunnel. You, the setup was then you connect the socket, you <coughs> prepare the HTTP connect method, which tells the proxy to open another socket to the destination. And you get the response from the proxy, everything is okay, the connection is set up, and so you do then afterwards, after this connect phase via the proxy is done, you do the usual HTTP. And of course, then the iteration when you do HTTPS or an HTTP proxy, you make the connect first, like before, and then you switch the send and receive callbacks to the SSL ones, <coughs> where you then have the SSL handshake to the server behind the proxy, and you do your HTTP again. And as a final combination, what you have, like you have an HTTPS transfer going through an HTTPS proxy 
So you have the <coughs> usual dance like we know already. You replace the, S the send receive with the SSL ones because you speak SSL to a proxy. Then you do the connect method. Then you do some SSL magic thing, which I talk about on the next slide. <coughs> you replace the send receive with the new SSL because you do SSL to the proxy and inside that SSL to the to server you connect to. And <coughs> what you have then here is like, if you put it into more <coughs> pictures, you have like the connection and then you have plugins to the connection like the default set re and receive which operate on the socket. And you have the SSL set and receive which get the socket inside. <coughs> Several TLS libraries allow you to uh, give them a socket to do the I/O on. They have this as a feature. Others <coughs> have uh, callbacks for that. But that's basically you have this SSL where you put the socket in. And for HTTP for SSL over SSL, which we had in the last example, the setup was that you put the first SSL that you create into the second SSL you create. And that's a feature of certain TLS backends like OpenSSL and some others, where you can stack SSL instances into each other. And that allows you to send SSL over SSL, which is then double encrypted. <coughs> the proxy decrypts the, the outer layer and sends on the inner, inner encrypted part to the server. And this <coughs> thing here, where you put an SSL <coughs> into an SSL, that was only available on certain TLS backends. Not every TLS backend was available. And that was the reason that HTTPS proxying was only supported on a certain number of TLS backends. The thing is, <coughs> when you talk about HTTP2 proxy, you have the challenge that between the outer SSL and the inner SSL, you need HTTP2 framing in between, right? and no TLS library can do that. So if you want to have HTTP2 framing between these two SSLs, you cannot use this feature. You need something else. Uh, just for completeness, this connection plugin or send receive was used in like SSL and other protocols like for HTTP2 also, Kerberos and the H3 implementations as well and SSH also. So they all replaced this send receive with their own to do their own special and <coughs> for HTTP2, it again had the possibility to set up the SSL to put that internally. That was a unique thing to the HTTP2 implementation. <coughs> so <coughs> just what I mentioned, what an H2 proxy, I often say H2 instead of HTTP2, so uh, would need would like kind of this block here because you have the SSL to the server, then you have the H2 framing layer, and then you have the SSL to the proxy, and that needs to be nested. So then I talked with Daniel about like, hmm, we need to change a couple of things here. And um, I don't know what if he was aware of what he was getting himself into here. Totally blindsided. <laughs> <laughs> Naive person. Naive Left person, the, yeah, I talked you into it. Let I, the fox into the hen house. There, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so if you wonder why I had so many lines of code in Daniel's <laughs> slides, uh, all started with this. <coughs> I'll make a small breather. <laughs> so I, I stated the problem, I stated what we need to do before I continue, like how we approach this. Are there any questions so far? It could, it could be added that we also had other ideas of what to go, uh, to expand beyond the H2 proxy. And features, right? you mean. So other protocol features, right? When yes. we were, already when we were discussing <coughs> that in the beginning, so we already had an idea that we needed a better sort of Lego piece yeah. concept. So we like needed a better p way to construct protocol chains. Sort of. Yeah. Um, the thing is, like, um, in a in a project that is like at that time twenty four years old, um, and was I think you started full time seven eight years ago, seven years. We have twenty nineteen five years five years, and if you're not <coughs> available to do full time work on such a thing, it's like you bring in new features very carefully. 
So you just try to find the places where you have to change the behavior a little bit to make the new thing work. Because it's, a, it's, it's the best way to do this if you have a, a more limited amount of time to put into this. And it's the least intrusive. What we did here was a more uh, bigger approach, which needs you to put in significant time and risks more breakage, which also occurred, to be honest. So we getting <coughs> to what we did. We invented something which I, we call connection filters. And this is basically Lego bricks, which have not only the knobs at the top, but also the holes at the bottom, so you can stack them, right? So the general connection filter has a send and receive and a <coughs> send receive at the bottom as well. So <coughs> for HTTP plane, we need a connection filter with just a socket. That doesn't have the holes at the bottom to stack <coughs> because it uses the socket and there it ends. If we do HTTPS, we have a connection filter that does SSL, which you plug the socket filter underneath, right? And if you send and receive, it goes through the stack up and down, so to say, if you hold it vertically. So for the HTTPS over HTTPS proxy, we have the SSL filter in between the HTTP proxy, which does the connect thingy, and underneath the SSL that talks to the proxy, and then underneath the socket. So if you model it this way, we have pluggable components which we can put together, like the connect how the connection uh, needs it. And uh, for example, these SSL filters are uh, are this this is the same filter code that just it gets used several times on the connection. And <coughs> the filters, there are default implementation methods for the filters, and the filters default sense. So for example, if you look at this, is uh, if there is a text filter in the chain and the stack. Use the send method of that filter to forward the, the buffer uh, to, to send. Otherwise, if there is no one, that's an error in the default implementation. So <coughs> we can stack a lot of filters, which just, if they don't do anything with the data, just pass down the buffer, which is performance-wise really not measurable impact. So it's very cheap if the filter doesn't need to do anything. In reality, of course, the connection filters <coughs> are a little bit more complicated than just two knobs. Uh, you have the send and receive, but we also have a specific connect uh, uh, callback in there. We have a close callback to shut down the connection, destroy to get rid of all the resources. A pulse set um, callback, which is used when we try to figure out how exactly on which sockets does this connection need to uh, monitor polygons and some control and query parts um, which are used, for example, finding out on a connection how many transfers in parallel can this connection do. So you can ask the connection about certain features. <coughs> Implementation-wise, that's a connection from, from the code that is installing it. It has a Boolean, are you connected or not? It's a, it's a state. It has a <coughs> void pointer like a context, which is local to the filter, where the filter can store its internal states and any variable it likes. And it has a type <coughs> where the implementations are of the different methods. The type has a name. It has some flags, like this filter does IP connections. This filter does SSL encryptions. This filter can do multiple transfers, or this filter is a proxy. Um, we have a lock level at the filter type come to that also. And so these are all stackable <coughs> for the other examples. I used the simpler picture, but so when we <coughs> the usual thing then what we what we changed how, how this just works, we look at the all the curl options that transfer is configured with, like use this proxy or do following <coughs> special protocol stuff and set up the, the stack of filters. And once we have that set up, we call the connect methods. And the connect method usually goes like the default implementation, 
if I am called already connected, I just return early, I'm done, everything is okay. Otherwise, I call the next, the filter below me to connect. And if that doesn't connect yet, for example, it has either an error return or it is not done yet, we return. So we call this method over and over until the, fi the, the different filters that are involved in this connection all report that they are connected. For example, <coughs> this would be a filter connect from the HA proxy implementation. The HA proxy, in case you're not aware, is a protocol which initially sends the client IP address to the server before doing anything else. So the server has an idea uh, who, is, who it's talking to. So in the connect phase, it waits for all its filters underneath it to be connected. Then it sends the HA proxy protocol information and then it's done and it doesn't do anything any anymore. It will just pass on all the send and receive data unchanged because it's not involved in the traffic then any longer. So <coughs> this is a more complex setup for a connection. We have an HTTP2 connection using uh, SSL, so it's HTTPS, uh, with an HA proxy protocol talking via a proxy that is also talked to with the SSL over a TCP socket, presumably. So <coughs> this is now, the advantage of this is not only that we can <coughs> combine the different implementation pieces, the different bricks that we have. Uh, the other advantage is that um, we have now more or less one place in curl which set, sets up this filter <coughs> stack based on the configuration. And the rest of the code uses the, the send receive and does not really concern itself so much with all these options and setups. Like we used to have more places where like, ah, if, if this is an SSL connection, we have to do some special here or we have to do some special there. Instead, it just can use now the connection as it is with the filter chain, which takes care. Um, small breather. That's Daniel in his uh, GitHub action uh, armor, <laughs> by the way. He's yep, that's how I look. We didn't see that yesterday. That's me at work. We didn't see that yesterday. <coughs> uh, uh, a question. <laughs> sockets, uh, sockets just sync to nothing, or do can you stack sockets as well? No. no. They never use the next filter. Yeah. It's, it's where things and have you considered a decision filter? Or, or will they be one stack always? Like uh, a so filter which does some special <coughs> things. Yeah. Yes, I will come to that. We, we have that as well. I, I will talk about the possibilities there. I just wonder, is this all synchronous? Is all the, uh, it's all non-blocking I.O. So it's like all the connect or the send receive will, instead of blocking, will return E again. But right, connect it's like also? connect also. Okay. Yeah, every, everything internally is non-blocking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I well, think there is <coughs> some slight FTP lie, but <laughs> somewhere, I think almost everything is non-blocking. Yeah, but the, like all HTTP, for example, is non-blocking. Okay. So it's like the all the filters, like if they can't send, they they return. Like this in the connect phase, they return OK and set the done flag to false. Like I, I'm not done. I'm OK, but I'm not done. Um, in the send uh, callback, it's like they re return an E again for, and uh, can also do a partial send, of course, of the data. That's also why the, the poll set callback there. So yeah. you, we can always ask every component here what to wait for to know when we are supposed to call it again. So the general thing is like, for example, uh, you are sending a request, you use the send method, it returns, for example, that it would block, so or, or it returns that it was only written part of it, and then the multi handling curl asks, like all the connections, like what do you want to fall, which sockets do you want to fall, in which direction, and waits then for the next event until to call again to to send more data. That's the rough basic handling. Um,
So an other example where I talked a little bit already is like you can now inspect the connection for certain properties. For example, you can expect, ask a connection, uh, are you encrypted or not? And it no longer depends on your interpretation of the curl options, if this connection is encrypted, but you cannot, the connection itself can just inspect its filters. And if it finds a filter that does SSL before anything else, it says like this connection is encrypted. But if it finds uh, like the HTTP proxy has this filter type flag, I'm a connecting, I'm doing IP connection because it does a ton of the remote server, right? So <coughs> if you have that on top, you find out the connection is not encrypted because you do not have a counter to SSL <coughs> and encrypting before you have the connecting filter. Even though you talk to the proxy maybe in SSL, the back end from the proxy to the origin server is not encrypted. So the overall connection is to be considered not encrypted. The other way around, you will find the SSL filter first when you when inspecting the connection and say, okay, this is now using end-to-end -end encryption. So, so even though underneath might be some proxying involved. Order, so, order is significant. Yeah, order is significant in, in what happens. And now the code can just say like, uh, for example, some protocol might use start TLS, for example, like, and will check like before it does that, are we already encrypted? Are we already using encrypting or not? And it can just ask the connection and the connection can just inspect and all the call options, the 300 something are no longer relevant here, right? So that simplifies certain parts of the code. So we can derive, uh, is this connection fully connected? Is it encrypted? Is it proxied? <coughs> All this can be queried. Um, the other advantage that we have is, um, from the previous ones, is like, <coughs> I talked about that the filter has a, a context, a local uh, block of memory where it keeps its state, its variables, and <coughs> by having that locally in the filter, we don't need to keep that anywhere else. Before that, we had like in, in a data transfer, there was a place for the SSL related information and the proxy SSL related information. And that was the place that was there. If you would have needed a third SSL for some reason, you would have made a third place there. Now we have a place inside the filter and it doesn't matter how many SSL filters we <coughs> install, they all have their local context and operate on local data and local state. That makes <coughs> the implementation more localized in a source file, for example. Easier to read, easier to maintain. Same for an HTTP2 filter, which now can keep its, like for example, the ng-HTTP2 session, which it opens, the stream state, and all this can, can keep it local. Another feature which we added to the filters is tracing. Um, since we have a filter name and we have a log level at the filter type, we can, for example, switch on tracing for HTTP2 related things, or for SSL related things, or for sockets. Like, um, you can say, like, I want to see the TCP operations that, that the filter does. And this tracing is, um, before that we had uh, your general info messages you get when you call curl dash uh, verbose. And we had <coughs> debug information, which was also only available in debug builds of curl, uh, which you should not use in production, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And now we have, <coughs> uh, in the filters, we have um, tracing um, in production code, which you can turn on. Either with, uh, if you use libcurl, there's a new method curl variable trace, where you specify the names of the filters or other features which should trace. And on the command line, you can uh, use dash dash trace config to give also these options. In debug builds, we can also specify this just over the environment, which is just convenient for testing stuff. Like run this test case with the curl debug, like with tracing on SSL and Hagel. And <coughs> just a sample, like the HTTP2 trace, and then what you get is like, 
is a set of command like trace config IDs time HTTP2, just do that comma separated, which gives you the time when the log entry was made. It gives you the IDs like the transfer and connection IDs. This is transfer zero using connection zero. And then you get like here HTTP2 from the filter specific things which you normally don't want to see, but in case you want to debug something, you then see like, for example, the frames being sent or being received from the H2 protocol. This is very useful for analyzing and <coughs> since it's in every production version, if we get a report, an issue, someone, some user on a setup or configuration which we cannot easily reproduce, we can ask him to <coughs> run, run your command with this trace config and give us the output. And so it makes analyzing stuff uh, easier for us. And it, uh, what's sort of hidden here is, is the for example, the IDs, when I, I had this issue the, the other day that I worked on with, when you do 500 parallel transfers, then the IDs is really good because it identifies the connection and the transfer. So when you get a multiple thousands of lines of output, it's yeah. easier to associate log lines with particular transfers. That's really convenient when you want to debug someone in yeah. these cases. I personally use the, the on, on Mac OS, where, where I develop mostly, I use the, the console. Uh, app for all these log files, and there you have like a filter which you can put in. And with this format, like Angular brackets, I can easily filter for individual transfer or individual connections to see what's going on. So, hey, I'm upside down now. Yeah, oh. in Power Armor, <laughs> you can do amazing things. Does that ever happen in real life? I can't I disclose that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, the question was brought up, decision filters, uh, I would say like meta filters, of all meta is a little bit overused in recent years. <laughs> so decision filters, filters manipulating the filter chain. What's the use of those things? Um, we use them now for IP eyeballing on IP. So we have an IP eyeball filter, which when it connects, <coughs> takes the address information that we have for this connection and the configuration, like you can tell curl to use only IP version four or only IP version six, but usually without doing that, it will try both if available. And it will start to make a socket filter for IP version six connection, TCP. And maybe if that doesn't immediately be successful, it will start another one on IP version 4 in parallel. And after another timeout where the connection was not established, and if it has another TCP address to use from, from the resolver, it might tear down the unsuccessful one and, and install another one for another address until the first of them reports success. And then it deletes the, <coughs> the one not successful and installs the other one underneath itself. So to start. Then this filter will report I'm connected now. So I've done <coughs> my part. Before that, it will be not connected. So <coughs> this is how we then implement uh, happy eyeballing with such a meta filter, <coughs> which is since this meta filter has also its local data, it can keep the filters it tries locally, so we don't have to, outside, we don't have any visibility really, or need to care about this in, in the transfer data itself. Uh, it's all kept there. Does happy eyeballs have that logic? Pardon? Yeah. What's ha holding the logic? What's the container here? Is happy eyeballs just inherent? Yeah, that does the, the logic. All right. Okay. So it's not an inheritance diagram, it's right, right, right. individual things. We don't do inheritance no. happily. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the socket filter does is not really aware that it is hold, held by an happy eyeball filter, right? Mm. It's the same implementation as before. Uh, another example is that when you make an uh, HTTPS connection, you're sending like uh, an ALPN, the application layer protocol negotiation. So you send, uh, curl sends, I want to talk H2 or HTTP 1.1, what 
my preference being the first one. And the server can reply with any of the two, uh, which will require different filter changes, depending on the answer. So <coughs> the HTTPS setup filter starts with an SSL uh, connection, sends the AOPN H2H1. And if it, the server answers, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to talk to HTTP2 with me, it inserts an, the HTTP2 filter underneath itself. If the server answers with H1, it won't do that, of course. So you have dynamic behavior, again, during connection setup, like that manipulates the filter chain. And this is our most insane meta filter setup. That's <coughs> when you say, when you ask curl to do HTTP3 to a server. That means if you say like, I want to do, you can say two things. You can say, I want HTTP3 only, like dash dash HTTP only. Then it will only try a quick connection. But if you say, I want HTTP 3, if you say, like, I'm willing to fall back to H2 or even HTTP 1, as long as I get a HTTPS connection, I'm fine. So what we do now is <coughs> we also have IP heavy eyeballing, of course. The quick connection might go by IP version 6 or IP version 4. Same for the TCP connection. So we have a meta filter which creates two HTTPS setup filters, which then creates its sub filters like happy eyeballing on the IP address or happy eyeballing on the quick UDP sockets. So you have four sockets involved in such a connection at the same time more or less, a little bit delayed like we try H IP6 first, I think that's our preference. Yeah. And there's a small delay that we say, okay, if we haven't connected after that many milliseconds, we also do an IP4. <coughs> and that same works on the quick UDP connection, where we try to. So we could have four sockets in parallel. And if we have multiple addresses from the resolver, we could replace these over time with another attempt for another address. Anyway, either we fail because no, nothing connects until the connection timeout, in which case the connect method will return an error, or one of those four will succeed. And then we take the successful one, make this into the filter chain for the connection, and throw the other ones away. So in this case, <coughs> you have an, H, uh, uh, an HTTP3 uh, was successful on, on IP4, and you get this filter stack to be used then for sending, <coughs> sending and receiving the transfers. That's a quite a complex thing, but <coughs> we can combine many components which we already <coughs> have, like the IP4, IP6 eyeballing, that was already in place. We just put something on top to have the quick and TCP alternatives outrace each other. Yeah, and, and this is really the reason why it is so convenient to use dash dash HTTP three now, right? Yeah, it just tries it. And if it succeeds, it succeeds. Otherwise, it will fall back and do the legacy ones. So if you do a transfer like this, it does this negotiation. It decides, okay, IPv four, HTTP three. Uh, you do the transfer, and it's over. You close the connection, and tears down this filter stack, and then try to do a, a connection just like that one again. Does it actually save the uh, what is negotiated so it doesn't have to do the happy eyeballs again? That's one feature which we like in some form or other. In so the no, it, it does not save anything. It'll do the it'll do it again. Yeah. In the sa uh, in the same order again. Yeah. So we have no place to store this information. Same with like if you just do a TCP, it's like which IP6 address, for example, worked in the end. That might be useful to try <coughs> as a first candidate on the next run, right? But you know, uh, just to, sorry to interrupt, but uh, it's it, that's a state, right? That's uh, what says that it's the same the next time, right? Wh wh mm -hmm. it, it requires that a lot of things are the same for the, the addresses to be the same. 
because if you for example if you move to another network sure then the, the maybe the name resolves is the exact same but maybe the the ip addresses don't respond the same way and stuff like that right so mm -hmm. it, i i i know uh, i talked to some of you before that the mobile operating systems they like to do that they can keep stuff but they know exactly when they switch networks so they can flush that information when they do change network we can't uh, at all as easily so it's difficult to cache stuff when we don't know if the conditions are the same the next time but maybe we can maybe with a very short cache yeah. we can we can still improve at least uh, wh when it comes immediately afterward since for example if you it might be most interesting to applications using a curl which run for a longer time and if you just if use, you use the for example line. change the order of the attempts that's also pretty if you would do it in the wrong order it'll just punish the connection you could still succeed but if mm -hmm. it's the same if it's the same one that is successful it might be uh, sensible to to try the successful one first next time instead of mm -hmm. the last or whatever for the curl command line it's like since we do not tear down connections after one transfer, we keep the connection around normally, unless the server closes it or something. So if you do several transfers <coughs> which go to the same server, if you do them without parallelism, they go sequentially using the same connection. So you pay this penalty only for the first one. Mm -hmm. If you do parallel transfers, like you tell her like dash Z if this, right? Um, it will, in case of H3 or H2, it will then do all these transfers on the same connection multiplex, right? Even only when you <coughs> increase the parallelism beyond what the server is willing to do on one connection. The server says, I have a limit of 100 concurrent transfers. And you tell curl to use 200 concurrent transfers, then it will open a second connection to the server. Um, but these are, I think, more edgy use cases. I think in uh, appli libcurl applications with a longer lifetime would probably could benefit more from that. I was thinking specifically of an application that maybe polls the server every minute and then uh, the server shuts down idle connections after 30 seconds or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, probably, that's certainly very common, yes. Yeah, so that's a feature which uh, we have talked about. Yeah, we have talked about it. And, and it's a so yeah, it's a question of what to cache and how and sort of what to do about it. But mm -hmm. of course, changing the order of the attempts, that would be an, an easy thing to do, right? So another discussion was like this, this new eyeballing proposal. Yeah, exactly. So th there's a, I mean, we're, so we're th th what, what Stefan has described, uh, at least the, the initial IP thing here, that's a happy eyeballs version one. That sort of, that's the RFC six something, six something, which is, pretty old by now. They did a Happy Eyeballs V2 years afterwards <laughs> that we don't do. And basically in that in that Happy Eyeballs, they, they, they say that we should start the next, we should start connecting as soon as we get any response back from DNS, basically, instead of waiting for all responses. Mm -hmm. Which is super difficult if you're using get other info, right? Because it returns <laughs> whenever, <laughs> when, when all the results are there. So it's basically rules out but but then there's now a new <coughs> happy eyeballs v3 proposal coming and that is even more complicated and but it also sort of that has at least made me and stefan talk about what what parts of that that we should sort of try to use in curl going forward and that involves the https dns records and mm -hmm. things like that because that introduces new address information in new DNS records that we don't currently get. Another thing is like what is described in the version three is like to have more than two sockets involved. Like if a socket doesn't connect, actually the first IP4 address we try doesn't connect after so and so many milliseconds. And you say like, okay, my overall connection timeout is like 10 seconds and I have now waited a second already on the first IP, so I should start trying the second IP address that I have. And what we now do is we close the first IP4 socket and try the next IP4 address on a new socket. 
And this version 3 now proposes to keep them around, just open more and more and more sockets until the first of them responds. So it just tries to eliminate the case that the connection is really that slow that you tear the first one down just before the answer arrives from the, from the other side. And, and I really like, I think that is the, the best. Yeah, so the I best like that part that. as well. And, and what we could say, it would be now very easy to change the heavy eyeballs implementation to just open more IP4 filters, right, and monitor them all. And I think I think actually the, the best, the, the winner in that scenario is when you connect, when you try to connect to an IPv6 host and it just is very slow. So you have to time out the first attempt and do a second attempt. But if you, instead of timing out, just, no, no, start the second one after X milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And then the second one will connect immediately. So it'll certainly work around some of those yeah, slow you, ones exactly. much better. So if you talk, if I talk about the performance tomorrow and, and for example, handshake performance, if you if we talk from Europe to the NGHTP2 org server, which sits in Japan, you get handshake times of almost 500 milliseconds. And there, this <coughs> new behavior could, could work much better. Yes. But to iterate, the nice thing is we have a local place in our source where we can tweak these things. And we don't have to, it doesn't spread around, like we have this in, a, in, a, in one place where we can change the behavior here. Uh, yeah, this crazy one. Um, so summary connection filters. We have a modular design, we have local state, we can do many instances without having to care about this on the on the other parts of the codes. We can stack this for many needs. There's discussions about several protocols like datagrams over quick HTTP3 proxies, for example, and and uh, things like the privacy relay networking stuff that involves other nested protocols into which we can serve much better with this design because we can stack the different things which are needed. We contain the complexity in the setup of the connection where we have to respect all the curl options that are there to make the right choice. But then when we use the connection, the use is much more simpler than before because it doesn't have to care about this anymore. It just uses this connection filter for data. Connection filters, that was the first thing that we did in like, six months or so. Yeah, that was Sovereign Tech Fund project. Yeah, project. exactly. They sponsored the project. We started at autumn 2022. Yeah. Uh, one more quick question for that. You had um, the initial Lego blocks you showed had two spots, send and receive, and then later on you showed, well, in actuality you have a half dozen or so. Yeah, I just... So I'm wondering, yeah, here we go. So that's a three, six, eight um, yeah. blocks. So how um, how stable do you think this API is going to be, or do you think that there's going to be some new use case that you need, and you have to actually make a ninth um, little socket there? Mm. How, how flexible question. have you found this this approach to be so far? It has been modified over time. Yeah, it has been modified over time. Uh, the poll set callback, for example, that is re that was changed. There was another callback before we changed that. I can talk a little bit about that way if you were interested. The control and the query are a little bit more flexible. They're like I.O. control. Like you send in, an, an for a query, you send in an email and then I want to know things. So you can <laughs> invent new stuff you want to query a connection for. Or do a control command. Control commands are, for example, like this transfer is them. The connection was involved in a transfer and gets the signal like this transfer is over. <coughs> Throw everything away that you know about this, right? That you may have state information about this. Or this transfer is just about to start in this connection, so it can prepare something. So these kind of, the, the, the last two are a little, little bit more generic. It's like the IO control trick of not inventing a new function call for every single feature you want to use. Um, yeah, it might change. Um, in general, we, uh, we have default implementations of the callback. So if a, um, 
if a connection filter like the HA proxy filter is just interested in the initial connection phase to do its thing and then it's just not doing any specific anymore. It can use for all these methods, it can use default implementations. So whenever we need to change defaults in these, we don't have to touch the HA proxy filter really because it's, it's sharing this. Um, but it might, of course, I mean, who can look into the future? Um, we have now, I think, this been, apart from the poll set, that was the le rec most recent change, and otherwise we haven't touched that. No, and I think it's, I think it's reasonable to assume that it could become fairly stable. I think what may happen is the graceful shutdown that might impact this. Yes. So we have um, got, got issues about um, connection shutdown. Uh, how clean we can do them. TL uh, yeah, TLS based. TLS primarily. based especially. Um, people are like concerned that use many car connections, they don't want to have uh, TCP RST resets on, on their network. And they want a clean shutdown. And um, normally this is not a problem, but TLS makes this complicated because TLS requires the handshake, TLS shutdown message to handshake between client and server. And this is like, um, you have to wait for the other to reply, so the standard says. I know that <coughs> several servers do not, <laughs> not do that because they want to get rid of the connections as fast as possible. <coughs> so, <coughs> and curl does not really nowadays really wait. Also, it sends the shutdown message. It tries a short read of if the server immediately responded, but if the server is a little bit more farther away or a little bit slow, yeah, curl also just wants to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't I mean, want to linger around. You want your command line curl to return and not hang around after the transfer for some seconds to to get the TLS shutdown from the server. Um, so it's a little bit complicated. Uh, we, we might add this feature at one point in time. I don't know. And if we do, we need to define a new phase for connections to, to tell the connection, like, please shut down now. Tell me what to pull in this shutdown phase uh, to, to make a clean, or at least <coughs> like an attempt so and so many milliseconds to make a clean shutdown. So that might have impact here. Have you uh, considered adding version to CF type to no. future proof? It's all in the same curl code and it's not an exposed interface, so we oh. are free to change it without affecting the API in any way. But if you want to support the old way of doing happy eyeballs versus the new. Well, well then I would make a second implementation and give it another name. Yeah, then would yeah, be two different ones, and then you would decide just yes, build different stacks yeah. at, at runtime time yeah. when you, which one you want to do. I mean, it's not that the implementation is not that large. I think I would run rather do a, a second, maybe <laughs> maybe with copy, paste, and modify, but still a second one because it's not that much code and that would allow me to switch dynamically to use either the old or the new one maybe. Maybe in the beginning we would like to offer this, I don't know, just talking. Just yeah, that would be right. possible. So I don't want to bring version numberings and backward compatibility and blah, blah, blah into this because it's really just an internal thing and should be, should be worry free here because it's not exposed that we are in control. We had uh, calls for an extendable version of libcode before, haven't we, where people want to add their own code without uh. you know, but setting it upstream. So this would be a great API if we even wanted to if we had to do this, yeah. Right, but it's uh, it's such a low level and it's such a big responsibility to say so we will support this going forward. Uh, For sure. Really quirky, and someone would need to provide a really really good use case for us to sort of <coughs> shoulder that responsibility instead of us just saying, sure, go ahead, you can maintain your own patches. <laughs> yeah. So it's a uh, yeah, they have to present a really good use case why why we would do that because it's it was sort of lock us down pretty significantly if we would suddenly guarantee this API rather than just say that this is an Antonio Lungeon thing. Yeah. One thing which we haven't implemented which would fit nicely into here are the, the download and upload speed limits. 
we could do them as a filter. Yes. So it's like the code you say, like, do not send more than 10 kilobyte per second or, or do not receive more than, so it's a speed limit option which you have in curl. Yeah. And this could also be done as a filter which just sits in the send and receives, monitors the clock and says like, I have sent so and so much in the last second, now it's time to calm down a little bit here and just do an <coughs> early return that call me again. So when, when, when do you decide like with what is a filter and what's sort of baked in behavior? Like alt server, for example, you know, uh, like what? How do you want my to? My my strongest indicator is that I I stumble into curl code which are hard to understand. <laughs> right. So the decision is pretty much: is there a pull request from Stefan or not? <laughs> 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 so I'm. <coughs> so that's a that's a tough decision. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I understand. I understand. <laughs> no, it's like often I I see like uh, if I have trouble understanding how a part of the code or a certain function really works because it's like in several source yeah. files over many years with has been yeah, yeah <laughs> it has been added as an if else case uh, in case of if def so and i think like eh, how exactly that? is this in all configurations really working and, and if i want to add something to it how would i how would i go about it and then it's like i'm uh, I often, uh, even though I learned that I often break small things as well by changing the code, I then often feel the need to m make another implementation which is a little bit tighter, more cohesion in it. So the criteria really is like, do we think we improve curl overall with the change? And that's then, and when I propose to Daniel, I say like, oh look, we, with this, we could achieve the following. We do no longer care here in this part about the, the stuff that we have it here. Then it's a judgment call. And sometimes he says like, um, I don't know, maybe in a different way. Yeah, and, but in many cases that it has, uh, it, it maybe it doesn't really <laughs> simplify the code as a general sort of, but it's, it, it removes, typically it removes a lot of protocol specific exceptions that mm -hmm. have been sprinkled all over, you know, everywhere and there we had this, but if it's HTTP, do like this, or if mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. uh, so we've removed a lot of those special cases by doing, yeah. and and also a little bit like uh, the um, uh, the TLS support for more TLS backends, for example, for doing TLS or TLS, that we have, we have sort of support more things in more generic ways. So in general, it has helped us just remain better. And I think, for example, doing the, the late uh, limit rating in, in a filter, I think that would also, for example, help distributing that support better for, for all protocols yeah. without exceptions. Because with the speed limit, for example, we only have this, we don't, we have, for many protocols we do, but yes. I'm not sure if it affects all. The current one, no, it doesn't. So it, th it would be a way, for example, to more generically say that we support it because it, it, it would, when it gets into the filters, it, become, it becomes unconditional yeah. for everyone that is using that filter. So it's in that way, it's convenient too. So in general, it's, I mean, we can't really say what should be a filter or not, but no. in general, going the to the filter helps building these protocol stacks that we want to. And I think uh, uh, as, a little bit that Stefan alluded to, I think we're going to have much more protocol stacks going forward. Mm. There, there's a crazy amount of different H3 mm. solutions coming. You know, datagrams of uh, uh, connect, uh, connect mm. TCP, mm. mask, with, which is basically quick over quick. And there's, mm. you know, there's a bazillion of new different ways and how should we support all those different ones. And, and proxying H3 over old proxies and proxying old HT over new proxies mm. and all of that. So there's going to be an explosion and uh, that is also going to be a problem for us, uh, API and UI wise, how we uh, actually, how a user is supposed to ask Decide Curl to set up that. Mm -hmm. But that's a different matter. <laughs> Internally, we at least have to sort of keep in mind that we're, we're going into a world when we need to sort of create different Lego towers in, in, in many more different ways than we've done before. So we need a way to sort of build different towers in different ways uh, without I too many. Very well realized. I think creating a primitive, because we know we're going to build these stacks, makes a lot of sense. Simplifies code. I really like the trace config. I really like the transparent 
generic handling uh, instead of all the itty bitty mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. stuff. Yes, but but uh, but I'm also very happy in, in that we sort of we've fixed it by solving existing s uh, code, right? Yeah. We don't we don't do this this for we might need it in the future right, because right, I right. hate it's that kind yeah, of solution. Yeah, we don't yeah, do yeah. things for what we might need in the future. But yeah. when we fix actual current stuff mm -hmm. and potentially future stuff, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the sort of ideal solution, right? A little bit risky. Uh, I have to yeah. admit, when you guys first started with this, I was a little bit, well, this <laughs> might be interesting. But you, you, yeah, yeah, you, you know, it's it. a fearless person who just yeah. jumps <laughs> in and <laughs> got to shovel a lot of code. And, you know, uh, confront me, how does it actually work? And then, you know, so yeah. uh, and it is really good for someone like Stefan, who's really fearless when it comes to this, <laughs> so, and, and confront me, so how does it actually work? And me having to explain how all of this actually came to be to this mm. point, and what what is the API actually wanting, and how, how yeah, is the right. sort of the mind, uh, how did we end up with this weird clutch in the code? And because a lot of, a lot of our de design decisions weren't really that well thought out from the beginning, right? It just seemed like a good idea at some point, and then we just got stuck with that because it worked, and everyone just moved on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been it's a hard. Design decisions through time, you can't ask yourself what's going to happen in the future, and you can't ask yourself what the hell were you really thinking. Right, right. So I, I think it's been really good. So Stefan has really sort of cleaned up a lot of old legacy, mm -hmm. uh, well, crap. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't crap, but it sort but of. It, it was grown. Grown and it you know. It was grown over the years. With yeah. Like I insert an if here. I insert a special case there for this new thing. Like, because that's also the, the best way to to bring in a new feature. Like, do not tear down everything you have before. You want to have the old stuff running unchanged, right? So this is very very good way to bring this thing. But over over time, it accumulates, right? Yeah. And it, it's like. You, and, and we have now designed this with the current needs in mind, really. I mean, we talk about that we see the application for future stacks. <coughs> but this focus was, I mean, apart from H2 proxying uh, uh, to, to clean up that fearful, yeah, I, I, I got burned several times on this because we had some behaviors which then broke. Um, I think, I believe that for 99% of this we could write test cases. That was the increase in test cases that uh, Danny was talking about. <coughs> I started <coughs> a new test suite because um, I wanted to have tests more uh, with parallel transfers and the, current, the primary test suite that we have cannot really do that. No, thank you so much for adding the, the plugins. And, and now we can do like I, we use a, an Apache server and a Caddy server uh, uh, to talk to them in several transfers. Apache I choose because I know that server very well. And for example, the Apache, we can load a dynamic test module in there because it has the, the dynamic module system. And we have then a, a response handler which can tweak to, to make delays responses to, to to abort with a certain error condition and to have curl react to this. So we can very controlled uh, edge cases uh, in there. For example, we can say we had this problem, this nasty bug with engine engine X and it's 8K H2 frames, which triggered right. a corruption. Yes. Um, and we could simulate this by telling the server, like send us the, the H2 frames exactly like Nginx does it, and then we could reproduce the bug. So that's that's very, and for each new thing, edge case, we, we uh, find either we add a bug uh, a check to the main test suite or in, into the PyTest. And then it's it's just net positive, I think. We have, I think, a more comfortable implementation. We have a test, we added test cases for the edge cases, which we had not had before. So uh, that makes us confident to continue. Since I'm now an hour in, I think I had something what, what similar stuff we did with the client writer readers, <coughs> just to touch on that, but I we can leave that out. I think we colored the I mean there are <coughs> areas where we do the same trick uh, nowadays with benefits. Um, but it's just the same basic you order look. So thank you. 
Thank you.